African American legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, aviation, business, sports, theater, and film. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they've been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I am your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and joining us in today's program is Eric Tate, Jr., documentary producer who has produced a wonderful documentary about the African burial ground, and I believe you call this documentary, and then I'll be free to go home. And I'll be free to travel home. That's correct, Dr. Brown. Okay. Well, tell us a little uh, how you got into it, what is the significance of it, and uh, what you expect to happen as a result of this wonderful project. Well, before I became an independent producer, I used to work for ABC Network Television News. And one of my former colleagues at ABC, Jim Clark, called me in January of 92 and asked me if I heard about the African burial ground that had been discovered in lower Manhattan. And I told him I'd seen some newspaper headlines, but I had not seen very much on it. And the upshot was the General Services Administration was going to put out bids to do a film documentation on what had been discovered, the significance of it, et cetera. And Jim wanted to know if my company was interested in bidding. And I said, of course. <laughs> so Jim and I went down to a meeting uh, at GSA at 26 Federal Plaza that early in January. And uh, GSA officials were quite surprised that we showed up and wanted to know how we knew anything about this bid. And I said, what does it matter? I mean, we're qualified producers, and we're interested in bidding, so let's get down to business. So they had a meeting. They passed out the material, and the background material that they had already had on the site was very interesting. So that's how I got into the project, day, day one, January 92. What I learned was that the African presence uh, in New York started in the colonial period. We didn't come here after the Civil War. We didn't come here after the Depression. We were here as early as 1626. And once I discovered how fascinating the material was, when I did not get the GSA bid, I determined to tell the story Just anyway. as an aside, who did get the bid and have they produced anything yet? Actually, yes. Uh, there was a, a company, I believe C Cuts TV got the bid. Uh, I was told my bid was approximately 100000 dollars over the winning bid and I, I found it impossible to believe seeing as how I had put a bare bones budget of one hundred and thirty thousand dollars for a one hour mm -hmm. documentary that was yeah. supposed to air on network mm -hmm. television or PBS so to be told I was a hundred thousand over I said well if anybody can do a documentary for one hundred and thirty thousand dollars prime quality material hey <laughs> more power to them so but it's taken me from 92 to 96 to get almost enough funding to do this project. But and the project is the, the film project is completed as of now. It is completed as of now. I'm actually laying in music as we speak. And once that music is in, the film is complete. Now, tell me how you went about approaching this. Because the African burial ground, which was found right near City Hall, um, as they were begin to excavate for expansion of the federal building, which is the reason why the feds get into it. That's right. And at one time, they were just going to move the graves and forget about it. But then they began to find these African artifacts. And many of the historians in the African community began to say, well, this is very important for us. And why should you disturb this burial ground? And out of that controversy came a memorial and a library and a number of other things. Basically, they have to do impact surveys on what construction may do. And so there's a study, proposals, everything uh, that needs to be done. If they ever find anything that even smacks of potential artifacts or historical value, they're supposed to slow down, change the approach, come at it a different way, file all kinds of documents with the federal government. This is the federal government having to do this with the federal government. It seems as if they were trying to not do that. They still wanted to move that building along. Uh, but enough people in the community learned that there had been su significant remains discovered. And so the community came up and rose and came together. Uh, and that put the spotlight on the fact that there was a significant archaeological and anthropological find right there in the heart of the federal complex in lower Manhattan. I think part of the political context is that it was felt that the federal people who were mostly white, maybe all white, did not really respect the African heritage. And uh, th th at one time they said there were only two or three graves, and it turned out there must be s several hundred. 
because this was the prime burial ground outside of the walls of the city uh, back in the 16th and 17th centuries. You're correct. That, that it, it actually evolved from the Little Africa community that had grown right outside the city walls in the northern part of what was then New Amsterdam, Port Amsterdam. Uh, the Africans lived and farmed and worked in the area, and they buried their dead close to where they lived and worked. And so at, it is estimated that between approximately 1673, because there's a reference in the city records that alludes to the fact as early as 1673 that the Africans had already been burying their dead there. So we know that 1673 is a valid date for at least the start of it, even though it implies it was earlier. Uh, they had been burying their dead there, and they estimate as many as 10, possibly 20,000 people were buried there before they closed the cemetery in about 1795. And of course, that's uh, over a 100-year period, and 1795 is just early into the formation of the Republic. That's so right this the really <laughs> shows mm -hmm. the timeline that's correct. in which Africans were involved in the New York culture. Uh, but then you call the film, you title it, Then I'll Be Free to Travel Home. What's the significance of that? The significance is that the original 11 Africans that actually came into the colony starting in 1626 came in as enslaved people. They, they, they were actually slave, enslaved by the Portuguese and pirated by the Dutch and brought to New Amsterdam as part of the workforce, the laboring force, to help the colony. Uh, and so they actually came against their will. And then when you walk on the site, as we did before it was covered over and, and the excavations were stopped by the Dust Savage Committee, subcommittee, uh, when you see those, those ancestral remains in, in, in various degrees of trauma, you'd see some with bullet holes in their heads, you'd see some with rib cages shattered. Uh, because of the way bodies lie in graves over years, the jaws usually come unhinged anyway. But for me, what I was seeing was folk who were crying for release, souls who really want to get back to their god or gods, who want to get back to the homeland that they had been taken out of. And so that's what came to me as I was on the site. They need to get back home to where they belong. And so the title came from the actual site. and. This uncovering in 1992-91 was a release for the spirits as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. Now we can tell their story properly and then they'll be free to travel on home. Well, we have a tape, a, a few minute tape of some of the things that you have sh filmed and are showing in this very interesting yes, approach. We, we, so we let us look at that now. Hello and welcome. I'm Lena Horn. Thank you for joining us on this fascinating journey. It's an exploration of times and places in American history from a perspective that's little known and seldom shown. Along the way, you'll meet some truly astonishing people, many of whose ancestors were buried almost 30 feet down in the heart of New York's federal complex in Lower Manhattan. Discovery of that over 300-year-old African burial ground the impact it's had and what it really means to the history of this country is what this program is all about. I told you in the beginning, it looked like everything that was said in the beginning, it, it looked like everybody's gonna be in that draft in that burial ground, but Africans, my ancestors, our ancestors. And it hurts when I see people have to grovel to get their thing over. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's sad. What could trigger such emotion? What could make this elderly woman weep these tears in such a public place? The fate of these early African ancestors, the question of what's to become of them and their ancient African burial ground, whether this hallowed ground where they were found will truly be their final resting place. 
Who were they? How many free? How many slave? How were they laid out and why? And why are so many early African Americans buried in such a prime section of lower Manhattan? Black culture in Manhattan or black history in Manhattan begins at the tip of the island. By 1644, Gracia Angola, Manuel de Rousse, Peter Santomé and the others had managed to gain ownership of lands they had already been farming, had petitioned and won partial freedom, and had time to work their own land when they weren't needed by the Dutch West India Company. Because family and community ties were so close, we can safely assume that those early African burials took place in an area near those families. Thus, this over 326-year-old burial ground evolved right where they lived and worked. Armed as best they could with hoes, knives, guns, swords, and axes, they set fire to a nearby outhouse and launched their desperate revolt. Thirteen blacks, free and enslaved, were burned at the stake. Eighteen were hanged, including Margaret Carey's lover, and 71 slaves were transported out of the colony. It is believed the executions all took place near the African burial ground, and that many of those put to death were buried there. I am not going to be a party of your disrespect. What people here have testified, scholars have called the most important archaeological discovery in this century. And with that having been said, this is it. That is really impressive film. That really takes you right into the guts of what you're talking about. And I can now understand why you talk about then I'll be free to travel home. But you mentioned earlier that the Savage Committee uh, helped to move this along. Tell us what the Savage Committee was and why it was so important. Uh, um, because the community seemed not to be communicating their desires to the General Service Administration quite articulately enough or with not enough power, GSA was proceeding to construct the building in its original form, despite what had been discovered. Which means building it over the African Building it on the, on the side, building a pavilion next to it, it was just disregarding the fact that this was a major historical land, landmark, even though it had not been declared that as such as yet. So 
a number of community activists, uh, I believe Arthur Maddox in, uh, was one, uh, placed a call to Washington, D.C., to Congressman Gus Savage, who was at the time, I believe, chairman of the uh, uh, House of Representatives uh, Public uh, Buildings and Work Subcommittee. Uh, and when he discovered what was happening, he decided to convene a hearing of his subcommittee, and he brought the subcommittee here to New York, right there at 26 Federal Plaza or in a courthouse near next door, and they held hearings on what was happening, what was the significance of the site, what GSA's posture had been, what they may or may not have done right or wrong, and when that day's hearing was concluded, he said, I don't think you've been too sensitive to this commu community, and uh, we, will, we think you need to stop what you're doing, and let's figure out another way. And as a result of that committee and that ruling, they ceased excavating. They stopped removing any of the other African remains. They took 400 out, uh, but 200 more were left in there. The site was redesigned, the building went up, but the pavilion section was stopped, and that site is now waiting for what will be a memorial to commemorate that burial ground and those Africans. Now, I understand that the remains that were removed went to Howard University and to one other university for analysis so that they could determine not only some genetic and biological information, but some historical information. They, they are actually all now at Howard University. Dr. Michael Blakey, who is now the current scientific director for the entire African Burial Ground Project, is heading the examination. He's a biological anthropologist, mm -hmm. uh, and his team are now analyzing what those remains mm -hmm. tell us about those ancestors, what kind of lives they lived, what kind of diet they had. Uh, and there's some very interesting findings that uh, we touch on in the documentary as well. Talks about load-bearing stress and, and, and people dying from, from head and neck injuries, from too heavy a load, mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, large childhood mortality rate. Uh, but that was prevalent amongst all children at the time. Whether or not the African children were slightly higher or lower, those are things they're still working on. Uh, the film uh, premiered in uh, New York in November of 96, and I understand in February of 97 is going to premiere at the Smithsonian. Right. And I understand that Lena Horne and her daughter have a role in this. It's interesting because when we first put the initial bid, uh, GSA wanted a, a person of color to narrate, uh, a, a very well-known person of color. And I approached a number of individuals to let them know that I had to have a low budget and that anything they did for me would have to do at scale, uh, but that I thought it was a great project. Uh, Lena Horn and her agent were the only ones who said, okay, we'll do this for scale for you uh, because we think it's a good project. And when I didn't get the bid, I, I, I said to her agent, I'm going to try to raise money to do this myself and I'll pay you a little more than scale. Uh, would you still be interested? <laughs> And he said, sure, just let us know. And for four years, I just sort of stayed in contact. Uh, and so when we finally decided to get it done, when I got some money from the Rockefeller Foundation, I never did get all the money I needed, but <laughs> with all, all the pulls and the strings and, and friends working, we've got a finished product, and I still have debts to pay off on it, but I'm sure we will. Uh, when we got to it, because I traced the arc from the first Africans right to the African presence up to the Civil War in New York, it made for a pretty lengthy documentary. And Lena Horn said, this is kind of a heavy, heavy load. I said, well, you're already in it. Uh, what do you suggest? She said, well, this sounds like something my daughter might do. I said, well, let's do that. Let's just make it a family <laughs> event. And sure enough, her daughter, who's an author, fine writer. Gail Buckley, Gail Buckley who wrote about the Horns. That's her, right, her Gail Lamette Buckley. Family. She liked the script and said, fine, yeah, let's do it. And so I have mother and daughter as on-camera host and narrator, prime narrator. And we have <laughs> guest voices. Earl Caldwell is the voice of some of the early historical uh, journalists. Reverend Johnny Ray Youngblood, voice of some of the early uh, uh, journalists and, 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 and ministers. And Reverend Howard Blunt, actually the current pastor of uh, St. Philip's Episcopal, voices the words of the first pastor, first black pastor of St. Philip's Episcopal, uh, Peter Williams, Jr. So I'm trying to tie the African community today to the African community historically, 
And I think we've succeeded. I think it's a very interesting and, and very educational project, as well as entertaining. Well, I can see from your enthusiasm uh, that you're really into this. Uh, but one of the things that I was wondering as you were talking is what is the message that you're trying to send to contemporary African Americans, both young and old, because oh. you're free to travel home. That takes care of the ancestors. Now, what about us? The me uh, it's a powerful message, uh, and I really want the, the youngsters in the schools to get this message. This is why we're going to do a long version for schools, and then we'll cut it down for the air version. Uh, what this message says is you may come in enslaved, but in one generation with hard work and perseverance, you can l lose your chains, mm -hmm. you can become landowners, you can become doctors, you can become entrepreneurs, you can impact the economy of wherever you are, because that's exactly what those Africans did. And then in the course of the arc of the little Africa community that they establish, mm -hmm. that almost died during the Revolutionary War but got resurrected after the Revolutionary War, what you have is the seeds of what became the bedrock of the black community in New York today. You can trace the arc right to the formation of the black churches, right to the formation of the independent entrepreneurs and the first black insurance company in New York, the whole bit. It's mm -hmm. all there from that original little Africa community. And it's not as if we didn't know how to do it in the early days. I don't know how we've lost it in between, but we need to go back and study it to relearn it. Now, the geographical area of that early African community was called Five Points, which was right near City Hall. And as I understand, the African community moved up toward Bleecker Street, and also some of it moved out to Brooklyn in the Weeksville it's, area. It's very interesting in that Five Points, which actually is what happened, uh, grew out of them, that whole area, when they filled in what was Lake Manhattan and the Collect Pond. Now, that whole street confluence that came about after that uh, became the first low-income slum area of New York. And it wasn't just Africans living there. Actually, Little Africa was on the other side of the Collect Pond, but we had Africans and Irish and other folk living in that Five Points area. Uh, and they interacted, intermingled economically, socially, the whole bit. Uh, and the African community just worked its way north as the city worked its way north. But one of the prime impetus that actually caused a major exodus is the back end of our show is the draft riots of 1863 when predominantly Irish mobs just went looking for blacks and anti-slavery sympathizers because they didn't feel like going to fight in the Civil War. Well, at that time, uh, Africans and others were being paid to fight in the war. For, as a matter of fact, I think it was the Irish were being paid. You could send a substitute. To That's correct. A substitute, and That's they right. didn't want to fight for the freedom of Africans. For two and reasons. Sometimes they didn't get paid, and two, they were worried that Africans were taking their jobs economically, whether they were or not. The Africans were here before the Irish were, so who was taking whose job? <laughs> so well, that, of course, that is a struggle. Now, out of this, to you always, not always, but you like to end with a positive view. Uh, you're free to travel home, and we've had the Back to Africa movement and so on, but for African Americans, home is here. That's correct. So what is the message you want the to send other than the fact that you can be enslaved and you can move into the larger society? Any obstacle, no matter how large, can be overcome. Those early Africans proved it, and the generations that came behind them followed in their footsteps. That's and, the message. And you proved it by getting the funding <laughs> to do this project. <laughs> um, and because that's one of the things that uh, we find now, that Africans, uh, African Americans, have made so many inroads into business, government, politics, film, media, et cetera. But yet at the same time, there still seems to be somewhat of a glass ceiling that keeps African Americans, except for exceptions like uh, Colin Powell and Michael Jordan, from uh, getting the broader recognition uh, do you think that this film will help to develop the empathy and the understanding on the part of the white community as well as on the part of the black community that says, well, look, uh, let's understand our history. Let's understand there were some not pleasant things here, but let's understand that people did survive, and it's the survival of those people and their contributions that made the country the and the city the way it that's is. That's the key phrase. The contributions of those people that are not documented in the current history books. Mm -hmm. That is the larger message because mm -hmm. we're going to take this and put it into the schools so that the, 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 the children of color can understand that they didn't just come 
from mm -hmm. an enslaved people. They came from people who contributed positively to the development of this country. Mm -hmm. New York's New Amsterdam, New Netherlands would not have survived had it not been for those Africans. Had they not used their skills in building roads and building dams and building all kinds of things and in helping defend the colony against the reprisals of the Native Americans because the Dutch were forever waging war <laughs> against the natives. Well, see, this comes two ways. The African American children need to understand this, mm -hmm. but the, the white larger population, population needs to understand this. The, and when I say the white, I mean the Asian population the larger and the population. Latino population That's because correct. the demographics are that uh, by 2040 or thereabouts, this country will be half people of color. Mm -hmm. And it isn't a question of one being better than the other. It's a question of the fact that everyone has and can and will make a contribution to maintaining a solid society. Uh, that's, that's quite correct. And what this documentary also shows is that people of color have been here since colonial periods, contributing since colonial periods. And if you open your eyes to the extent of their contribution, you'll understand that this society is what it is, not because they were here taking handouts, but because they were here providing positive contributions. I won't ask you as we come to the end of this program what your next project is. Well, I'm trying to raise additional funds so we can continue doing other documentaries on the role and impact of people of color in the history of this country because there are all kinds of stories still not told. And particularly in the history of New York City. The history oh. of African Americans in oh. New York City is absolutely fabulous. Come it, see it this show. It tells us where the city goes. Come see this show. You will be flabbergasted about what you find. First slave revolt in North America, in British North America, was here in New York City. It wasn't in the South. Mm -hmm. Right here in 1712. There's all kinds of history about Africans in New York that people don't know, but it's right there in the records, right there on 31 mm -hmm. Chamber Street. Okay, we've been talking with uh, Eric Tate, documentary producer of Then I'll Be Free to Travel Home, a documentary about the African burial ground. Very, very interesting, very, very exciting. Thanks for being with us today on African American Legends. My pleasure, Dr. Brown. It's always a pleasure talking and conversing with you. Okay.